The most influential economist of the 20th century was John Maynard Keynes. Well into the 21st century now, his theories are institutionalized, and in most policy quarters, they form their relatively unchallenged orthodoxy. In 1971, President Nixon, then President Nixon, took the USA off the gold standard, explaining, quote, I am now a Keynesian in economics, unquote. A few years earlier, Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman had said of his profession, we're all Keynesians now. Now, John Maynard Keynes's main claim to fame is his advocacy of deficit spending as a tool of economic recovery. In a depressed economy, the argument runs the government should spend money that it doesn't have. That will stimulate demand, which will in turn stimulate supply. And once the economy is back on track, tax revenues will increase, and the government can then use its increased tax revenues to offset its earlier deficits. Thus, in the medium term, the government's books will happily balance. Now, Keynes was not original in this. Uh, before him, some economists had urged the occasional use of deficit spending to counter downturns in the economy. Keynes's originality was placing that particular political policy tool within the context of a much more general economic theory, and a, a brilliant one, however much one disagrees with it. But that was uh, 1936 that that general economic theory was published, and since 1936, we've experienced decades of huge deficits growing and increasingly accelerating government debt. So uh, what went wrong? Well, and even in our own era of what seems to be Keynesian policy on steroids, we should ask an intellectual history question. Well, how close is Keynesian practice now to Keynesian original economic theory? That is to say, how much can we, for example, blame John Maynard Keynes for what his followers or alleged followers are doing now, half a century or 80 years later. I returned to uh, Keynes from rereading James Buchanan, another Nobel Prize winner, and his uh, co-authored with Richard Wagner's their seminal book, Democracy in Deficit, The Political Legacy of Lord Keynes. James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1986 for his pioneering of public choice theory, as it's officially called, or as he informally liked to call it, politics without romance. Let me put you further behind on your reading now. Democracy in Deficit, uh, in my judgment, is essential reading for all political thinkers. And two of the book's points about assessing John Maynard Keynes's responsibility for his legacy strike me as especially important. Now, the first thing that Buchanan and Wagner stress is that John Maynard Keynes himself was, a, was very far from being a Democrat. He was a political elitist, a fairly strong stripe. Buchanan and Wagner, in their Democracy in Deficit, they quote Keynes's biographer, uh, R.F. Herod, and uh, Keynes's you know, kind of explicit and ongoing assumption, which was, quote, that the government of Britain was and could continue to be in the hands of an intellectual aristocracy using the methods of persuasion, unquote. So the import of this is that maybe Keynes thought that his prescriptions about deficit spending and so forth should not actually be applied in a democracy. Only an aristocracy of intelligent and disciplined politicians could be trusted with Keynesian policies and the theory behind it. Now, after all, you know, if we think about democracies and uh, their close cousins, republics, and their hybrids, democratic republics, the kind of politicians who typically gets elected, don't they uh, typically tend to be more cunning than intelligent, more pandering, less disciplined? So if we take Keynesianism with its invitation to deficit spending, uh, and we put that in a democratic context, that's just going to be a huge guilt-edged invitation for deficit spending when necessary, but that guilt-edged invitation right, will be abused, and it's just going to lead to misdirected and out-of-control spending. And here we are today, 
So maybe the conclusion is that Keynes himself is not responsible for the popular application of his elitist theory. And we can at least float that as a question. So uh, if we can't blame the aristocratic Keynes for democratic Keynesianism, then we have to shift the blame to his followers who abused his system and misapplied it. Now, a second point that uh, was uh, mentioned and stressed in Buchanan and Wagner's Democracy and Deficit is that Keynes's book was published, his general theory was published in 1936, and in large part it was responsive to the Great Depression. At that time, the majority opinion among the political and economic experts of the time was that emergency government measures were very much needed. But the Depression was an emergency. And Keynes's prescriptions say that the emergency measures would and should be suspended once the emergency has passed. So we fast forward a decade later, 1946. The Depression is over, World War II has ended, and Keynes's theory then says we should stop the deficit spending. The emergencies are over. But coincidentally, Keynes also died in 1946. And so if his disciples are continuing to apply his methods, well, that's not Keynes's fault. So should Lord Keynes be let off the hook then for his theory? Well, my answer is going to be no, definitely not. Now, there are three broad types of criticisms that can be lodged against Keynes's theories legitimately. And one type certainly is a moral criticism. One of the great achievements of the modern world has been its expansion in human freedom. You know, we've gotten the governments largely out of religion. We've eliminated much censorship. We've eliminated slavery and the laws that support it. We've expanded the range of women's liberty. We've freed up markets in lots of ways. And in keeping with liberty in all of those areas, the economy too should be a network of voluntary trades. The government is an agency of coercion. Everything that it does is backed up by the police, the military, the prison system, and the threats of those. But what Keynes is doing is for reintroducing significant government compulsion into the economy. And he's providing a political and economic sophisticated rationalization for doing so. That's both a throwback and it's an immorality. It's an infringement on freedom in the economic realm, government manipulation. And this is a criticism that's made by Ayn Rand strongly, for example. Now, another kind of criticism is cognitive. Right? Keynes's theory asks politicians and other central planners to have some sort of an accurate God's eye view on the economy from which they're going to per- perform their manipulations of various sorts. But that God's eye view is impossible, right? And another achievement of the modern world has been its evolving and improving social scientific right, understanding right, of how prices work in markets to coordinate the knowledge and the actions of millions of individuals, each of whom knows his or her own value circumstances best. Distant economic planners, no matter how intelligent they are and how well-meaning they are, they can only make very crude macro estimations. And those crude macro estimations are always plagued with unintended consequences. And this is a criticism that's made strongly by Ludwig von Mises and Nobel Prize winner Friedrich Hayek, for example. Now, the public choice criticism is a third criticism of James Buchanan, for example, and uh, his followers. By contrast, what it focuses on is incentives. It's not a moral criticism. It's not a cognitive problem. But the claim here is that Keynes's great mistake is going to be to ignore or to downplay the role of incentives in a political context. Now, Keynes's advice was in part for nations like Great Britain and the United States, and each of them, Keynes knew very well, had significant democratic elements in them. So he should have taken that into account. For example, uh, if we come to the United States, uh, 1930s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes president. And he might have been the sort of semi-aristocratic economic statesman, in quotation marks, that Keynes had in mind. Uh, Interestingly, in 1932, before he was elected, uh, the candidate, Roosevelt, did strive for the high ground. Quote, uh, 
Let us have the courage to stop borrowing to meet continuing deficits. I know a continuation of that habit means the poor house. Unquote. But once he was elected, President Roosevelt realized very quickly and pointedly that spending programs are enormously popular politically and that taxes and spending cuts were frighteningly unpopular. And so he changed tune rather quickly. So Keynes was then at least naive. He should have been able to foresee what politicians will do in a democratic and republican context. If you think about uh, how many of us feel temptations to spend money, right? uh, we can pay for it later somehow. That's very seductive for many people, even when it's their own money they're spending. But somebody will pay for it later somehow. That's irresistible to politicians, especially when they're spending other people's money. And of course, there's always some quote-unquote emergency that can be seen as needing spending to fix it. And there's always going to be economists hanging around who like being close to the seats of political power and who will tell uh, politicians whatever they want to hear. Ongoing spending can always be rationalized. So those criticisms are strong, I think, of Keynes. The moral criticism about the limitations on freedom, the cognitive criticism about the impossibility of accurate God's eye view on the economy, and then the third criticism about incentives operating in a democratic and republican context. But the most important point, I think, in response to Keynes is that he's not really and merely recommending a few surgical interventions in the economy to smooth out cycles or to jumpstart moribund economies. Keynes's economics are part of a comprehensive, interventionist, and collectivized philosophy of morality and politics. Long before the Depression, long before the new theoretical elements of the general theory in 1936, Keynes was already a strong opponent of free market capitalism. And here I want to uh, take up one of Keynes' popular reputations. You know, he does have a reputation in many quarters for being a fixer of some problem, problems within capitalism. And I think that's a, a, a mischaracterization. For example, notice the, uh, the subtitle of Robert Skidelsky's 1992 intellectual biography. John Maynard Keynes, The Economist as Savior, 1920 to 1937. Well, savior of what? Now, standard historical view is that the 1920s were this era of rip-roaring capitalism, which all ran amok, it collapsed at the end of the decade, and it ushered in the Great Depression of the 1930s. But along came Savior Keynes, to, as uh, his name suggests, save the day with some structural interventions. An even stronger version of the Keynes as capitalist fixer comes from Professor Robert Heilbrunner. Now, Robert Heilbrunner was probably the most respected socialist academic of the late 20th century. In his best-selling book, uh, The Worldly Philosophers, Heilbrunner contrasts two attitudes about capitalism. The Marxist one, which of course is hoping to destroy capitalism, and the Keynesian one, according to Heilbrunner, which is all about trying to salvage it. The battle was between, in Heilbrunner's uh, rhetorical uh, language, between Marx as, quote, the draftsman of capitalism doomed, uh, unquote, as Heilbrunner phrased it. And then Keynes, by contrast, he is, quote, the architect of capitalism viable, Unquote. So thus, making capitalism viable is, according to Heilbrunner, Keynes's main purpose. Now, I think that's a mistake, and I do find it strange that in his chapter on Keynes, uh, Robert Heilbrunner discusses all of John Maynard Keynes's major works, or at least mentions them significantly in passing. The Economic Consequences of the Peace, 1919, The Treatise on Probability, 1921, a tract on monetary reform, 1923, a treatise on money in 1930, and then the magnum opus, the general theory of employment, interest, and money in 1936. But he does not even mention Keynes's very important essay on political economy, The End of Laissez-Faire, which was published exactly in the middle time period of all of Keynes's major works. 
So I want to have a closer look at the 1926 end of laissez-faire, in which we find Keynes harshly criticizing free market capitalism and pushing for substantial, substantial socialization, collectivization, and major interventions into the economy. A couple of points are worth highlighting at the outset. First, on the morality of capitalism in contrast to socialism. Socialism, Keynes argued, has much more moral merit because it, quote, departs from laissez-faire, which, unquote, Keynes believes has little to no moral merit. Socialism, uh, this is quoting Keynes directly now, quote, takes away from man's natural liberty to make a million, unquote. And it, socialism, that is, opposes, quote, unlimited private profit, unquote. As Keynes goes on to say forthrightly, quote, all these things I applaud, unquote. So note, Keynes believes it is a very good thing and a moral prerogative to take away anyone's right to make a million pounds, dollars, whatever you want to denominate it. Second, on the economics of money and credit, Keynes uh, says he agrees entirely with the socialists that the government should provide, quote, the deliberate control of the currency and of credit by a central institution, unquote. Notice what we have here, a central bank controlled by the government, which in turn lessens or eliminates entirely competing currencies and credit institutions. And that, too, he believes is a very good thing. Now, so far, Keynes is explicitly rejecting two of the fundamentals of free market capitalism, the moral claim that's built into capitalism, that people have the right to liberty in financial matters to make as much money as they want. And he's also rejecting the moral, uh, sorry, the, the economic fundamental of competition among monetary and credit institutions. But Keynes's rejecting capitalism at its fundamentals does not make him a socialist. And we do find in the laissez-faire that he does also criticize the authoritarianism that's necessarily built into socialism. Already by the 1920s, he recognized the theoretical and practical dictatorialism of socialism, and he did think that that was a flaw. So his goal was to make attractive a principled middle way between the extremes of capitalist freedom, which he thought was bad, and socialist control, which he thought was also bad. But the middle of the spectrum is a pretty big place, so uh, where along it does Keynes belong? And here are some specifics. Keynes does think that individuals should be allowed their own private savings, their own private savings accounts. Okay, that's fine. But he does believe that the government should control and direct savings at the macro level. And here's a quotation. We need, quote, a coordinated act of intelligent judgment. It's required as to the scale on which it is desirable that the community as a whole should save, unquote. So what he's saying is that the government should set upper limits and minimal limits on how much a community is allowed to save at any given time. Additionally, he goes on to say that it should be the government's decision about how much of those, quote, savings should go abroad in the form of foreign investments. So control over individuals' money uh, and how much they're allowed to do investment in foreign businesses, that's going to be subject to governmental controls. Keynes also allowed that many businesses can and should remain private. So he's not in favor of socializing everything. But, quote, many big undertakings, I'm going to say that again, many big undertakings, particularly public utility enterprises and other businesses requiring large fixed capital, they still need to be semi-socialized, unquote. Sex and family life. Keynes believes people should be private in their own bedrooms. The government should stay out of individual people's bedrooms. Nonetheless, again, at the macro level, Keynes urges, quote, each country needs a considered national policy about what size population, whether larger or smaller than at present or the same, is most expedient, unquote. And not only that, in a nod to eugenic theory, Keynes argues that, quote, 
the community as a whole must pay attention to the innate quality as well as to the mere numbers of its future members. Unquote. Now, all of this and a lot more is John Maynard Keynes in the 1920s. And by the time the general theory is published a decade later, Keynes has not changed his political philosophy. Rather, what has happened is that he has advanced in the sophistication of the economic tools that he's making available for realizing it. He knows where he wants to go politically. The economic theory is a set of tools in the toolkit that politicians can use to get to that ideal theory. Now, of course, Keynes might have called for very nuanced uses of this or that policy. Likely, he would have had ongoing arguments with his followers and their judgments about precisely when and how to implement these policies. And, of course, he might have underestimated significantly the difficulty of taking you know, a clean, abstract economic theory and putting it into messy political practice. But the point is that he did advocate a robustly very robustly interventionist economic system in principle. He did provide a sophisticated set of tools for policymakers to use whenever they think they need to intervene in the economy. And he did give a very bright green go-ahead light for politicians to apply his theories to real human beings in real economies. So the huge influence that Keynes has enjoyed for precisely those points, that's exactly what any theorist wants, and that's the most that any theorist can hope for. So Keynes owns the results. Now I want to make uh, two you know, further points in this uh, concluding section about properly categorizing John Maynard Keynes along the political spectrum. And both points are taken from the 1930s, the very decade in which he wrote and published his magnum opus, right, the general theory. And both of them, in my view, undercut any claim that Keynes was a, quote, savior of capitalism or a designer of capitalism viable. The first point to mention is that in the 1930s, Keynes was the chairman of the board of the left-wing magazine, The New Statesman and Nation. Now, this publication that had originally been founded by Fabian socialists, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, Fabian socialism is a more paternalistic and authoritarian version of socialism, and it rejects any populist form of socialism. It uh, believes that, of course, socialism be, should be for the masses, but socialism should not be run by the masses, as the masses are largely incompetent and uh, not disciplined enough to, uh, to know what's good for them. So the Fabian Socialists called for the collectivization of pretty much all aspects of human life. Uh, and another difference with, say, Marxist, uh, more violent socialism is that the Fabians believe that socialism should be brought about by evolutionary and peaceful means rather than violent revolutionary methods. But by the time we get to the 1930s, when uh, Keynes is chairman of the board, the magazine has moved even further left, especially as Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union seems to be carrying on the Marxist-Leninist legacy. And the Soviet Union seemed, from the perspective of many, many on the far left, and particularly in the West far left, to be leading the world into a bright socialist future. And the New Statesman in the 1930s regularly published articles that praised the Soviet Union, and it was now fully under the iron-fisted control of Joseph Stalin, and his authoritarianism was praised. To his credit, Keynes was not as enamored with Stalin as the rest of the, uh, or many of the other writers, rather, and certainly the editor of the magazine were, and he did sometimes argue with them that their frequent praise should be tempered with some admissions that there were actually some problems arise as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was attempting to bring about its vision of a collectivist utopia. Now, the second point I want to raise, uh, also from the 1930s, is that one of the very great fans of Keynes's work was the fascist leader, the real fascist leader, Benito Mussolini, who had high praise for Keynes's economic theories. And here's a direct quotation from Mussolini himself. Quote, 
Fascism entirely agrees with Mr. Maynard Keynes, despite the latter's prominent position as a liberal. In fact, Mr. Keynes' excellent little book, The End of Laissez-Faire, 1926, might, so far as it goes, serve as a useful introduction to fascist economics. There is scarcely anything to object to in it, and there is much to applaud. Unquote. Now, Mussolini obviously is making a very strong claim of there being a near-perfect fit between fascist economics and Keynes's economics. And, of course, that requires a direct comparison of Keynes's writings with Mussolini's writings. And so if you would like to make your own judgment and your own comparisons uh, in the transcription, when it is published, I will link to the two relevant documents, which are obviously the end of laissez-faire, the one that we've been discussing in this podcast, and then also the co-written with Gentili, The Doctrine of Fascism. Uh, that's uh, Mussolini and Gentili. Now, I want to make a side note on this connection about uh, the, the relationship between Keynes's economic and more authoritarian and fascist uh, political regimes, and these are from Keynes himself. The very first two translations of the general theory were translations into German, uh, German rather, that was published in Germany, and into Japanese and published in Japan. And in his 1936 prefaces, which he wrote for those editions, Keynes noted that his ideas would likely meet more receptivity in those authoritarian nations than in, for example, the much more liberal United States. Now, to my mind, both of those points about Keynes from the 1930s, his role in the Soviet communist-friendly New Statesman magazine, and explicit praise from fascist Mussolini. They also suggest a political spectrum issue for those who still tend to put fascism on the far right and communism on the far left. It's important to note that Keynes's circle of fellow travelers and fellow admirers, right, they include both genuine fascists and genuine admirers of communism. Now, Keynes was not a fascist and he was not a communist. There are important differences of degree between him and them on many issues. But please, let's put to rest the false view that Keynes was a theoretician of capitalism and its savior. He rejected free market capitalism in all of its fundamentals. He took giant steps in the direction of collectivism, such that the true fascists and the socialists of both the national and the international variety properly recognized him as a comrade in theoretical arms. <laughs>